Um, uh, Bethany, Bethany and I had discussed a few topics that might be interesting. And so um, uh, I'm gonna jump in with uh, what would be required for a territory to become a, a state um, because that's really um, where the constitutional history in New Mexico starts. Uh, it typically starts with an enabling act uh, introducing Congress that it's not required. New Mexico had several. Um, the one that really got us rolling was in June of 1910 um, uh, for a territory to become a state, uh, a constitution had to be proposed. It has to be accepted by the population by vote. So in 1850, uh, right as we're becoming a territory, we actually approved uh, a constitution and we sent it to Washington. On its way to Washington, President Zachary Taylor, who was in favor of New Mexico becoming a state, he died. Um, and so that constitution was never approved by the president and by Congress. Another constitution um, was made in 1872 and it went to the voters and the voters rejected it. In 1889, we had another constitution that went to the voters and the voters rejected it. Um, finally, uh, following a constitutional convention in 1910, on the 21st of January of 1911, the voters approved a constitution. Now, one of the provisions to become a state was that it had to be approved by the president and Congress and Taft um, and the Congress did not like the proposed New Mexico constitution because it was very restrictive. Um, and so they uh, rejected it and called for a, an amendment to the constitution that would make it easier to make amendments to the constitution. That was, that had to be done, although it did not have to be approved. The voters could have rejected the action of the Congress, but in fact they didn't. And that was called the blue ballot, a special ballot to change the constitution before it was ratified. So as far as I know, New Mexico has the only constitution that was amended before it was adopted. Um, and then um, the Congress acted by simple majority vote on a joint resolution to grant statehood. So that was basically the process whereby uh, we got a constitution in place and we became a state. Now that constitution has been uh, described as being uh, a conservative document. Um, it Just to give you a couple of ideas of the conservative ideas that it embraced, um, it didn't, did not take up the issue of women voting. Women were only allowed to vote for school board elections. So it missed an opportunity that other states were already, uh, new states were already embracing. It evaded the controversial issue of prohibition um, it rejected all of the national progressive ideas, and that capital P progressive, the ideas uh, that were being uh, sweeping the country. And one of the things that is most characteristic of the Constitution is that it was nearly impossible to make amendments to it. Um, and this was done intentionally. The drafters of the Constitution felt like they had created pretty much a perfect document um, that didn't really need to be amended or wouldn't need to be amended. Um, and so um, the Constitution as adopted um, has 24 articles. Um, when it is amended, um, our Constitution is unlike most constitutions in that what we do is rather than create a new amendment, we edit the articles that are already there. So we change the wording in the, uh, the 24 articles that are there rather than um, new ones. Uh, you're familiar with the US Constitution. We have uh, obviously prohibition went in, uh, the right for women to vote came in, um, uh, then prohibition, you know, prohibition went out. And so we just remove those amendments from the federal constitution. So basically what we do here is we edit. Most of the attention over the years and most of the controversy, and indeed the controversy that kept the first constitution, the 1910 draft from being approved, circle is around Article 19. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit to you here because this is actually a complicated issue. 
um, and why it's so difficult to amend it. So Article 19 required that a legislative proposal for an amendment have a two thirds vote of the elected members of each house of the legislature voting separately. So two thirds of the elected members of each house. Um, there were some exceptions for very early on, the, the first regular session, two years after the adoption. And then uh, there was a provision for every eighth year thereafter. But um, there were limits on the number of amendments that could be submitted for any one election. Uh, it could be in the context of a regular election or a special election. And there was a particular hurdle that was placed in the amendment provision it required a 40% affirmative vote in one half of the counties in the state. And then there were Article 7, which pertains to election, and Articles 12, which pertains to education. There were special protections put into those. Um, and those have been described as being impossible to amend. Um, no amendment could be submitted to those sections. So two sections of 12, uh, section eight and section 10, and section one and section three of seven. No amendment could be sub even submitted for those sections unless it was proposed by a three fourths vote of the members elected to each house voting separately. So you can see the, the number, uh, the majority, overwhelming majority of agreement that you would have to have in order for this to happen. And then on top of that, there couldn't be an amendment except to those requirements. So the, those, those additional requirements unless you had a constitutional convention. So there are layers and layers of difficulty adding on to making it very difficult to change the constitution. And so the article has been changed. Um, in 1996, there were some changes made. There are now three ways that you can adopt a, a change for a constitution of New Mexico, but all of them require voter approval. So legislative proposals, which are made piecemeal, which is the only way that we have ever made an amendment um, or a constitutional convention, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, or, and this is what was added in 1996, you could have an independent commission recommend. So we now have three ways, but the only way that we've done it is what it was called piecemeal amendments. So just to give you an idea from the from 1950 forward in the legislature there have been more than 3000 proposals brought to the legislature. Now, not that passed. Um, there have been uh, 300 that have gone to the voters and more than 170 that have passed. So we have made minor changes. Again, our changes tend to be editing. Um, and that current, the current requirement, the extraordinary requirement in Article 19 and that refer an article that refers to 17 and 12 are still there. Three-fourths vote by the members elected to each house voting separately. Um, and then each amendment approved by three-fourths of the people voting on the amendment statewide. So in the age that we live in now, the way the country is divided, it is virtually impossible to change any of those. We would never have 75% of the people approving anything. Um, um, so um, the um, 
Okay, so I'm going to skip some of that detail because that's pretty, and I don't, I'm, I don't want to overdo my time. I want to touch on a couple of things that I think are really interesting about our Constitution um, that there is a sort of a misunderstanding about. Most people believe that New Mexico is an officially bilingual state, right? You hear that all the time. Um, New Mexico does not have expressed in our Constitution any official language. It's quite possible that had English been proposed as an official language, the voters would have voted it down, but we don't have an official language. What we do have is some provisions that protect Spanish speaking people. For example, a proposed amendment uh, to a constitutional change, laws, serving on a jury, ballots, so voting, and Spanish-speaking children have the right to an education. Those are de facto bilingual elements, but we don't have uh, we don't have an official bilingual state. The only official bilingual state in the United States is Hawaii. Um, there is a provision in Article Twelve, the one of the articles that can't be changed. This is often expressed as um, proof that we're an officially bilingual state. Section eight of article 12 says that the legislature shall provide for the training of teachers to learn English and Spanish. It doesn't require them to know Spanish. It doesn't require the classes to be taught bilingually. It requires that the training is provided. And the training, of course, is available any place that you go for schools of education in New Mexico, UNM, NMSU, um, you can certainly learn to speak Spanish, but it is not a requirement. And that is something that is often mentioned about our constitution. Another point, which is really interesting, is that um, Pueblo Indians, uh, did not gain the right to vote in New Mexico until a court challenge, the Trujillo versus Garley. Uh, Michael Trujillo was from his letter Pueblo and Garley was the uh, clerk of court, I believe, in Valencia County. The suit was brought, uh, Trujillo was a, a Marine um, and a three judge federal panel ruled that the uh, the language in the New Mexico Constitution, which had come out of the United States Constitution. And it basically was arguing that because Pueblo Indians did not pay ad valorem taxes, um, they couldn't vote. So that was thrown out. Um, and it, it, even though it was thrown out in 1948, it was actually not changed in the Constitution until 1953. So um, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, and sort of as a side note, um, even though Trujillo, Trujillo was protesting that he couldn't vote, generally speaking, the Pueblo people didn't want full citizenship at that point because they were afraid that um, it would cause uh, sovereignty issues. So, so that's kind of an interesting piece there. Um, now, and I'm, I'm going to be running out of time here, so I'm in a hurry. Um, another topic that um, Bethany, and I, Bethany and I talked about that she wanted me to mention was um, the fact that we have had an attempt um, to have a completely new constitution. Um, if you look at all 50 states, you will see that there are many states that have had multiple constitutions. Um, there are a number of states that only have one. Um, most of the states that have only had one have had their constitution since the 19th century, or in one case, even since the 18th century. But most of the ones that had later ones uh, subsequently changed them. So the, the 19th century constitutions and the early 20th century constitutions tend to be very detailed. Um, and so Governor Jack Campbell who 
was a contemporary of John F. Kennedy and so was progressive in that way, advocated for changes in the New Mexico Constitution. And there were four areas that he was interested in changing. Believe it or not, and some people will probably find this incredibly hard to believe, New Mexico has a very weak executive. Um, he wanted to strengthen the executive. He wanted to modernize the judiciary. He wanted to make the amendment process easier. And he wanted to get away from what was clearly the reflection of distrusting government that was in the 1912 document. Um, and the goal of the changing of the constitution that he was, and we had a, a constitutional convention, was to create a modern constitution that would be brief, simple, the watchword being flexible. Um, we have a weak executive because there are agencies that operate outside of the governor's control. Um, I happen to work for one. Um, I work for a non-executive adjunct agency. We have more than 30 of them. We're not directly controlled by the governor. We have multiple elective executive positions in New Mexico. We have at least 10. So we have an elected state auditor. We have an elected Secretary of State. Many states have that, but many states don't. Um, there are agencies, boards, and commissions that operate outside of the governor's control. Um, some of the members of those boards and commissions are ex officio members and not appointed by the governor. And what Campbell in the Constitutional Convention in 1969 proposed was that there would only be two statewide elected officials in New Mexico, and that would be the governor and the lieutenant governor, and that would give us a very strong executive. Uh, the convention concluded after, start, they started in 1963, they concluded in 1969, they presented the new constitution to the public. And in December of 1969, the people of New Mexico voted the new constitution down. Um, and so at present, the only way we can change our constitution is by piecemeal. And I think I did it, Bethany. I think I'm right on 20 minutes. Yeah, that was that was right on time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, it is. Uh, it's super fascinating to hear about um, sort of a 70 year, uh, almost a century long journey. Uh, I'll open it up in case anybody wants to ask a question first. I have a, I have a couple questions of my own, but again, anybody can feel free to um, unmute and ask some questions or type it into the chat, whatever works. Well, I'll, I'll ask a quick question. Yeah a former state historian, Dr. Hendricks. Okay, uh, talk, can you talk a little bit about what finally was able to happen where we now have consolidated elections and the, the school board election did not have to be the 30 days apart from that? <laughs> uh, well, Janet, you obviously have, I mean, this is a conversation, so why don't you talk about it? No, you don't. You're, that's why they pay you the big bucks there at the. No, no, they don't. They don't pay me the big bucks to do this. <laughs> I know. I'm just giving it a hard time. No, go ahead. And it's a topic near and dear to your heart, and I know you have. So share with us your thoughts. Well, Seriously. no, just I know that the election coming up uh, here in Albuquerque on November second uh -huh. is the first time, to my knowledge that we will not only be voting on uh, the mayor, city councilors, but we'll also be voting on members of the Albuquerque Board of Education uh -huh. and the Central New Mexico Community College Board. Right. And, and all this was enabled finally yeah. after years of changes. And, and I don't know if the constitution got a, actually got amended or if 
if the laws just superseded the constitu constitution to an well, no, the, oh, Okay, so that wouldn't happen. Um, I don't, <laughs> the laws wouldn't supersede the constitution. That's not how it works. Oh. Um, but I don't, I'll be honest with you, Janet, I don't, I know that that consolidated election has happened. I'm not sure um, whether that was a statutory change. Um, I, I honestly don't know. And I apologize. I, I, I did not prepare for that question. That's all right. And if I could, I would have muted you so you couldn't answer, answer me that. <laughs> I don't know. If somebody knows how that came about, please hold forth. I don't know exactly how that came about. Well, I, I yield the floor to the next question. <laughs> okay. Um, well, one of my questions going back to what you had said uh, earlier, um, I think you said that it was President Taft who had called the first the first constitution attempt, he called that, that draft restrictive. And right. I want to know what was restrictive about it. <laughs> It seems pretty restrictive now, a little bit. Okay, so um, what they focused on, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't present the original version, but um, what they were, they were opposed to the language in Article Nineteen um, about how you would go about the process of amending it. It was even more restrictive than it is now. Right. So it was that those limits that are built in there. Um, I mean, even even though now when you look at it and in the reality, see, I mean, you have to remember in when this constitution was written, um, it the the breakdown between Republican and Democrat was very lopsided, and so that there was really not very much concern uh, that it, that anybody would really be opposed to it. The state was overwhelmingly democratic. And, and so um, it was just more restrictive than it is now. I mean, when you look at it now, it's incredibly restrictive. I mean, if you wanted to change these particular provisions now, you would never be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And we know that because you wouldn't get even close to three quarters of the, and it, it, it used to have, it, it used to have a, another provision uh, that, that added on, not only did you have to have this overall percentage, but you had to have the percentage within each county, which is two thirds in each county. So it was even more restrictive um, than, um, than this thing we have here. Um, and so, I mean, you could look at it and say, well, why would we want to change these provisions? Well, a lot of these things are incredibly specific. And, and the idea with a modern constitution is you provide a framework. Um, I mean, obviously our constitution has been, um, it is not a modern, it's an 18th century constitution, right? It, it, it's a very specific, very long document, right? Um, and a modern constitution doesn't have all those provisions. Um, and so they wanted it changed. And again, that went to the voters and the voters could have rejected the will of the president and the Congress and kept all of those provisions in there if they wanted to, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so they made it a little less restrictive, um, but it's still very restrictive. And, and, and the, the ones that, I mean, see, part of the ones that, that are not changed, probably nobody would want to change anyway. I mean, I don't think anybody really cares that, that, well, I can see how you might want to change it. You might want to make it a bilingual state. You might want to change it and say, not that the state had to provide, provide it, but you might say, um, we're going to require teachers to be bilingual. Mm -hmm. Well, it, and, and that might be a change that you might say, well, we want to preserve Spanish language in New Mexico. And so that's what we're going to do. Well, you, you'd never, it'd never pass. It would never pass mm -hmm. because you'd never get the majorities that you wanted to do it. Mm 
So mm -hmm. that, that's an example that I can think of that somebody might want to do. I don't think anybody would object to, to the idea that uh, Spanish speaking children are entitled to an education. I mean, I, don't, no, I mean, why would you want to change that? But, but there are things that I, you could look at and say, well, I think we ought to change that. And, and, and it would just never happen. Hmm. Uh, Janet, you have your hand raised, please. Um, yes, I was wondering if uh, Rick could speak something about in, in 1970, when we actually did have the uh, term of the governor was extended from two right. years to four years, and that was considered a huge improvement, you know, a much more stable, that they could still only have, you know, only have one term, but but that so that right, all right. coincided with the 1969 convention that failed. So Rick, Rick how did how did uh, how did we so, get the four year term? Well, I mean, we, so out of that convention, there were eight amendments that went to the public, right? Not all of them passed, right? But so it wasn't a complete waste of time, right? I mean, they examined things that needed to be done. Um, it's just that they had to go forward in the piecemeal process. Um, Brandon asked a question, then it went away. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Do you want me to read it? Uh, um, yeah. Let me jot it down because I it was about article. I, I don't remember. Section what five of article two, uh, which states the rights, privileges, and immunities, civil, political, and religious, guaranteed to the people of New Mexico by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo shall be preserved inviolate. And do you uh, yeah. think this promise has been realized? Oh, no, this is observed in the breach. I think we all know that. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and of course, this is something that is a, is a, a really hot topic. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really no question that um, neither the spirit nor the letter of the treaty have been respected. I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, when I was state historian, one of the most frequent lectures I used to give was had to do with the, the loss of um, land rights, Hispanic people. Um, I mean, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but um, if, if you look at um, people who had legitimate claims to land that should have been respected under the treaty, um, you know, it, it's close to 90% that was rejected, or maybe even more than 90% of those claims were rejected. Um, interestingly enough, the, the Pueblo Indians got their rights were pretty well protected, but the if you look at before before the arrival of U.S. government under under let's say the most recent one under Mexico, um, most of the land was in either communal land grant or private land grant hands, right? And because the federal government largely rejected the the Spanish and Mexican concept of commons, um, if you looked now, what you would find is that, well, first the land transferred to the public domain and became federal territory. And then to provide for, say, for schools, the federal government transferred a certain amount of land back to the states. So if you look at land ownership in New Mexico, under Mexico, and, and then currently, you'd see that the federal government and the state government are outsized owners of land and the people who would have uh, had a legitimate right under the treaty to that land um, lost most of that land. I mean, that, that's pretty much a generalization that holds. Um, and of course, one of the big problems is what would a solution to that look like, right? I mean, you there's um, the land that's uh, the two parcels that are Carson National Forest is belong to other people, belong to private individuals and belong to communities. Um, that, that's an example here in the, basically in the Santa Fe area of, and so they've got a new 
uh, draft use plan to try to address some of the traditional uses. Um, and of course, there would be lots and lots of land grant heirs out there. So I've always wondered what a solution would look like, but it's a problem that has not, not been resolved. Um, you know, some of it was a cultural conflict. If you imagine when the US moved in and you had the idea of the Jeffersonian yeoman farmer occupying the land and to, you know, to populate is to govern and that sort of thing. Um, that was a big clash when, when the US started to arrive in most of the fertile land, certainly the land in the, along the Rio Grande and in the tributaries was already in, somebody else already owned it. Um, so not only was there, um, there was a legal clash, but there was a clash, big clash of cultures. And obviously it was resolved in favor of the conquering people and not the people who are here to begin with. I mean, that, so the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was, um, has not been upheld. I mean, that's my opinion anyway. Brandon, are you there? Is that what you wanted me to talk about? You've gone away. That's okay. Sure thing. Sure thing, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, when was that treaty written? Uh, 1848. Okay. And that was a treaty that was imposed on Mexico, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The United States military was occupying Mexico City, hmm. in the outskirts of Mexico City is um, now, I mean, where you go to see the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, that community is Guadalupe Hidalgo, Hidalgo from Father Hidalgo, the name has been changed. It's now part of Mexico City, but it was in the outskirts. And that's where the treaty was negotiated, but it really wasn't that much of a negotiation. Uh, the United States was imposing the terms that we wanted to on Mexico. And the treaty as it was negotiated and signed uh, was not ratified by the US Congress. So a number of the key provisions that Mexico thought they were agreeing to and had agreed to when they signed it were not, were not ratified by the Congress. So not only was it imposed on them, it wasn't what was eventually imposed, what the current treaty is, didn't even have all the provisions that Mexico had agreed to. So um, hmm. it was a bad deal. <laughs> and of course, many treaties are imposed on people under those circumstances. You think of the Treaty of Versailles in the World War I. I mean, those kind of things, um, the victors are often able to impose the terms that they want. And it created, I mean, there's lofty language in the treaty about how the rights of people in, in, area acquired by the United States, how those rights are gonna be preserved, but it, it just didn't happen that way. Hmm. Uh, Michelle, you had your hand raised a while ago. <coughs> Do you wanna ask a question? Yeah, I just, I just don't know. I just don't know very much about, about this history. We, we became, a, we, were, we became, hi Rick. We became a, <laughs> we became a territorial, uh, a territory in 1848, correct? No. No. <laughs> well, um, when, when were we? When did we become a territory? 1850. So we were okay. under mil military occupation mm -hmm. from 1846 through basically when when the, when we have the, the New Mexico is invaded, um, and we're under military occupation through 49, and in 1850 we become a territory. At the when we should have become a state, 1850 California becomes a state that they come in as the bear Republic. They come in. Um, we should have, we had the, the other requirements that I didn't mention because we were sticking strictly to uh, the constitution. You had to have a certain population. Well, we had plenty of population to qualify as a state. Mm -hmm. um, but the territorial period begins in 1850 and, and lasts so until statehood, 62 years. So during territory territorial period, um, the 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 um, a constitution can be drafted until we become until New Mexico becomes a state or is accepted into state. So so 
the the process of becoming a state, one of the steps is to draft a constitution. So it's your proposed constitution. You present it to your populace, which we did in 1850. They vote. If they vote to accept it, it then goes technically to Congress, but um, the president, and, and certainly in the case of uh, when when it went to uh, when we finally got one, um, but Taft was able to veto it uh, essentially. So it goes to Congress, and then Congress um, once it's a, so the, the approved one by the state goes to Congress. If if the president and the Congress accept it, then there's this joint resolution, and and they vote on it, and so that's the process. So from 1850 on. Uh, we had the 1850, the 1872, the 1889, all of those attempts um, to, and see, part of the reason that, I mean, everybody thinks that, well, from, from 1850 on, everybody in New Mexico, all the people in the territory wanted to become a state. Well, that wasn't true. Um, some people didn't think there was an advantage to becoming a state. Um, they didn't want to be taxed. They didn't want a lot of the things that would come with statehood. And so it wasn't universal that everyone wanted to become uh, just march right into statehood. So we had one approved, two rejected before we got one approved. Uh, so part of that process, I mean, the context of the road to statehood is really because of the racist and on the one hand and also political motivation on the other, people in the East Coast did not want New Mexico to become a state. Um, there was a pretty even balance in the Congress. They didn't want to tip that balance one way or another. Um, they didn't want Western states to become more powerful voting bloc than Eastern states. And then initially, um, the Eastern press was very anti-Catholic. It was um, racist, uh, anti-Mexican. So it, it was very common for the press and also visitors from Congress who would come out to New Mexico to say the people are ignorant, they don't speak English, um, they're too Catholic, um, they're too Mexican, they're too Indian. So that, that strain of anti-Catholicism continues in that period up until the time when it starts to die out against the Irish. So anti-Catholicism was on the East Coast primarily focused on the Irish, but that as the Irish become more settled um, and later you have Italian immigrants, you can focus the, the racist attention on these uh, Italians and Irish politicians become more prominent. That piece of it falls away and it, it becomes more um, they, there's too much Spanish spoken, they're too Mexican. And so you have those factors really trying to keep New Mexico from becoming a state. Um, and that's, that's the main reason that it takes so long. Um, and those attitudes, some of those attitudes were reflected by people who lived here as well. As, as Anglo people began to move in, they, a lot of people said, well, the people who live here are not ready to be and that's what you heard a lot. Not that, that New Mexico would never become a state, but that it wasn't ready to become a state. That it needed to become more American, better educated in English, more familiar with institutions from the East. Um, and, and so when you look back on it now, it all seems very racist. Um, and that's pretty much that. Um, does that... Rick, yes, it does. I just, but I can't help but wonder how, how does that document, I guess, like um, what is the status of it during territorial period if it's not accepted through Congress? I mean, said, what's like, the, the, the status of the area? Of the, con of the constitution document that was not accepted by Congress? Oh, well, the ones that are not, the ones that are rejected are just rejected. Um, and you have to, you have to draft another one. 
And so that's why we've had a total of four, three that didn't make it and one that did. So is there, but is there, is there a territorial constitution? And no, that... a ter no, because the territory doesn't function that way. The, the executive in a territory is provided from Washington. So mm -hmm. the, the govern the territorial governor um, is uh, appointed out of Washington. Often in the case of New Mexico would be a former military person. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Lou Wallace is a good example, territorial governor who wrote Ben Hur, Civil War uh, general. Uh, people of that nature uh, were appointed. Um, we we did have from the territory, we had an an, an elected representative, non voting member of the House, so somebody who could observe. Um, but. And, and sort of express the opinion of New Mexico formally. Um, and some of those individuals were strong advocates for statehood and, and some of them were not as strong, but um, that was how the state was represented in Washington. So, and of course the state, the, 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 the territory, the people of the territory largely resented the fact that the executive was appointed from outside and didn't really know anything about um, often didn't know anything about New Mexico and frequently didn't care anything about New Mexico. Mm. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, there's a, a quick question in the, a couple questions in the chat, but um, I can get to those after if Janet, you want to ask your question out loud. Oh, well, it, it's a question and a comment. Mm. That, Perhaps Rick uh, remembers, but sometime around 2008 or nine, the legislature uh, passed a requirement that all high school students have to take one semester of New Mexico history. Um, unfortunately, in many school districts, that's been relegated. It's sort of like the, um, if you have to teach New Mexico history, it's, it's not a good thing and, and people were not prepared um, in, in a perfect world, Rick, what would you want students, what, what would you want people to know about New Mexico from studying New Mexico history? Like, are there three or four key things that? Well, I mean, Janet, um, to me, one of the fascinating things is that I, I still feel like that people in New Mexico have an appreciation for the history of the state in a way that a lot of places don't. Okay. Um, history is really alive here. I mean, we have controversies. We're tearing statues down. We're doing all sorts of things that sometimes countries do, but we're doing it, you know, as, as a state, as we're trying to wrestle with our history. Um, ideally, to me, we would take more of an approach, and this is going to sound odd. In Texas, you have to learn Texas history. I mean, it's a different view, right? It, it's it's a... Um, it's not a view that encompasses all of the uh, complexity of Texas, but they do require that you know it. Um, and, and I just think, you know, I mean, typically here uh, you have, I mean, in, in some school districts, at least when I was state historian, uh, third graders, seventh graders, and maybe juniors, somebody in high school, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember talking, well, obviously the little kids, you know, that's a completely different thing. Middle schoolers and high school people um, certainly are capable of it. But as you say, um, you have to have the teachers prepared to do it and you have to have material. And one of the great challenges, I don't know, Rob, Rob was going to, uh, Rob Martinez was going to be here. I don't know if he was able to do it. I see Nicolasa is here, uh, current occupants of the Office of the State Historian. Um, it is very challenging to come up with material to teach the complexity of New Mexico history uh, because we have so many, what I always refer to as constituencies, mm. right? It, I mean, I'm not saying that other states don't have it, but I think in a way it's more alive here than it is. So, I mean, I couldn't really point to, I mean, it would be wonderful if people knew, um, I don't know, that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and all that that has meant um, that would be awesome, but um, 
uh, having written a book about it, the, the history of the Pueblo League and how that secured, I mean, why New Mexico's indigenous communities have a land base and nobody else has one quite like that, right? I mean, that would be something yes. I would love for people to know. Why, why is that? That's one of the things that makes New Mexico unique, but so is our history of rocketry and all that stuff. I mean, you're, you're really talking to the wrong person to name three or four things that would be important. I mean, I think history should be incorporated in all of the disciplines in the same way that science and math should be, it ought to cross fertilize. I worked at one time on a curriculum for the community of San Elisario in Texas. And what we were doing was embedding history in um, math and science curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are ways to make it not like, oh my gosh, I've got to go take history this period. Boring, yep. right? But you can teach the history of science and teach the history yep. Uh, you can teach history as well. And to my mind, that would be how I would like to see it done. And there have been efforts in that way. I mean, UNM's education department, I know years ago um, was trying to do a lot of that, but it's a challenge. Okay. Thank well, you. More than you wanted to know. I know, Janet. Oh, no. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Um, getting to the couple questions that are in the chat. Uh, uh, Ellen asked that if, if anybody is interested in learning more on this area, um, what and where are the good resources? Is there a collection at the archive? Are there specialized archives? So, I mean, I, I would say that if you're interested say, specifically in the, the constitutional history on the, the website of the Office of the State Historian, which is NewMexicoHistory.org, um, there is a, under, I think it's under special projects, there is a little sub website that's just about the constitution. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of information about there. That website in general, newmexicohistory.org has a ton of information. <coughs> um, I mean, if you're interested in just New Mexico history in general, and I hope you would be, uh, Rob has a YouTube series, New Mexico in 10 Minutes. I think he's up to 50 some or more episodes. Um, he's got a column that's in the Santa Fe, New Mexican. Um, and there, there's lots and lots of places. Um, uh, there are a couple of good books um, uh, about the process of becoming a state. My favorite one is the 47th Star. David Holby's book on the process of New Mexico becoming a state. There's a lot of uh, just wonderful history about New Mexico in that, in that whole 62 year period. Uh, highly recommend that book. And that book relies on a lot of source material here at the State Record Center and Archive. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of good material about that. I put the, the NewMexicoHistory.org link in the chat for anybody who wants to check that out. Sure. Um, and the final question that we have from Yania, uh, interesting comments about why New Mexico wasn't considered ready to become a state in light of the statehood movement in Puerto Rico. Are there any lessons mm -hmm. for Puerto Rico from the New Mexico statehood journey? Wow, that's a great question. And we actually looked at that whole thing when we were looking at some of that. I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, and I think Spanish language is probably a big part of that. That is something that, you know, the, the United States, even though we have people from literally all over the world here, um, and there are still many, many people um, who don't speak English at home. It's not their first language. Um, and, and we will have uh, uh, another influx. We already have had an influx of people who uh, from Afghanistan, who many of those people will not speak English. Um, we still are a country that overwhelmingly is monolingual English. And so I think part of the problem that we had here in New Mexico was that we didn't have a very well-developed education system to begin with. Um, it was very poor, as it still is. Um, and we did have an awful lot of uh, and awful is not the right term. We had a, a wonderful number of, of people who only spoke Spanish, can only communicate in Spanish. Um, and I do think that that's part of the challenge that Puerto Rico 
faces. But of course, it, it really depends too, I guess, on what your point of view is. If, if, if your point of view from the standpoint of a Puerto Rican who wanted to become, uh, wanted Puerto Rico to become a state, then you would have other parallels um, because there would be, if you looked at the early, uh, right before the statehood period, when, the, when people in New Mexico were arguing over, is there a real benefit? Uh, what's the economic cost to us? You know, the transfer payments that would go to Puerto Rico now would be far in excess of uh, what they would be. I'm sorry, my phone's ringing. <laughs> uh, uh, it would be uh, the transfer payments that they would receive would be more if that were if they were to become a state. Then that probably would go down. I mean, we we sort of get more transfer pay payments still in New Mexico still. So there's some issues. But if you wanted to be a state, you would have one view. And I don't know if the person who put the question in, I don't know, but if what you were interested in was Puerto Rico becoming independent, then you'd have another issue. Um, New Mexico was not really uh, advocating becoming independent. Um, the only issue that we really had was, would we come in with, with Arizona um, together somehow that up until 1863, Arizona territory in New Mexico it was all New Mexico, and then Lincoln divided it. So there, in, in, after 1850, there was a period of time, and even after that, even after they split, um, there was what was referred to as jointure, um, and there were propositions um, about bringing the two states in and have them become states at the same time. And interesting enough, say 1906, uh, Arizona already had its own unique political characteristics, very different from New Mexico. And so New Mexico voted, voted overwhelmingly for joining at the same time as Arizona in this jointure movement. And Arizona didn't want to, they didn't want to join at the same time New Mexico. We ended up in the same year, um, but not at the same time. So um, and interestingly, also their initial um, constitution piece presented some problems as well. But so, I, I, I there are parallels to the situation in Puerto Rico, but there are also some things that are very different. And I think it depends on the political attitude of, you know, whether you're pro-independence, pro-territorial, you know, whatever. I mean, the, it's it's very different and. And I don't know what the current majority opinion is in Puerto Rico. Um, I, I just don't know, but there certainly are parallels. Maybe, uh, uh, Yanya, you, you can enlighten me. <laughs> well, I don't have a lot to, to say to enlighten you. I think you, you touched on a lot of things. I, I agree the language thing is probably um, a huge big deal. But I just, some of the terminology that you use in describing the New Mexico journey was, is still the terminology that we are using today yeah. to describe Puerto Rico in terms of a non-voting um, representative in Congress or yeah. you know, uh, referring to Puerto Rico as a territory. Mm -hmm. um, those, it seems like that when you talk about it in terms of New Mexico, it sounds like it's you know old history. That was so long ago and yet, um, it's something that is actually still present right. in U.S. history through through the history of Puerto Rico and its relationship to the states. Um, but I think, and I also appreciate you pointing out the the main difference, which I think is that New Mexico wasn't advocated for independent advocating for independence at any point, um, and there has been that movement on and off present in Puerto Rican history. So that definitely, that and sorry, I don't wanna to talk too much, but the other thing that I think you also mentioned earlier in your talk about how uh, certain things in the constitution, New Mexico constitution were approved with grant, you know, huge majorities and that probably wouldn't happen today. I mean, I think we see that same thing when you think about uh, whether it's within Puerto Rico and how people feel about the status or, you know, in, in the United States Congress, which ultimately has, you know, the power to decide whether there would be any grand majority in, in our current political state, I 
can't imagine that there would be a majority either there or here. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But thank you, though. Mm. This has been great. Thank you. Well, we are just at um, the end of an hour, so we've reached we've reached our time. Um, but this has been a very fascinating conversation. I appreciate um, all that you've all the remarks that you've made, Rick, and um, I think everybody who is here today and asking questions um, very engaging. 